Hello everyone, um, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you about one of my great passions, uh, emotional intelligence. Um, I'm a television reporter, I've been doing that for about 20 years and mostly working in investigative journalism. And over the last four or five years, I've um, become quite obsessed uh, with emotional intelligence in the world of psychology. And I'll tell you a little bit about my journey from one to the other in a moment. Um, but it's, it's really fantastic to be here as you're talking about the wonderful power of technology. And as we are living in much more sophisticated times, we are emotionally becoming much more sophisticated but it's difficult, isn't it? To, I mean, I just heard there's only two of you here that are paying any attention to your inner lives. But it is difficult in these very complex times that we're living in to be thinking much more about um, our inner lives. And I'm going to be here today to help you to think about how to harness that, but how to harness it really powerfully so it makes you much stronger, both personally and professionally. But just before I do that, um, I need to, to get a volunteer from the audience for an exercise I'm going to do. So is there anybody here who's willing to come up and just do a really straightforward, simple exercise? You won't have to do any talking. You're just going to stand there and look good. Thank you. Please give him a round of applause. OK, so um, if you could just ho hold this paper cup for me. And I'm going to get you to just pour water, just a tiny bit of water in there every time I ask you to, okay? That's all you have to do throughout. Now, don't support this arm. So that arm needs to sort of stand out a little bit like this, yeah? Maybe you could, you could loosen it a little bit. That one, you could support as much as you want and you can even put the water down if you need to, okay? All right, does that sound all right? Yeah, yeah. okay. So um, let me uh, just take you to the spring of 2012 and it was the Olympics, and I was working as a reporter for NBC News, which is the most watched news network in America, certainly was at that time, and um, I was working on their primetime news program, which was the most watched news in America, news program in America. And I had been working as a TV reporter, as a live TV reporter, at that time for about 17 years, and I probably had as many hot meals as I had done live television. <laughs> And you could argue it was um, as easy for me to do live TV as it is for you to hold this cup of paper cup, right? That feels straightforward and easy, doesn't it? Okay. So I was working on a story, and because of the, um, the time difference, it was about uh, 12 o'clock at mid midnight that I had to go live. Uh, so I was, I was being sent out to work on this story, and um, I was quite tired because it was midnight. Could you pour a little bit of water in there? And... Um, the cab driver, that's great, thank you, and then the cab driver that was taking me to my location, he got lost. So I was directing him towards uh, where we needed to go. A little bit more water. And um, my news editor kept calling me to, to sort of discuss changes in the script, which is very much par for the course. You do that quite a lot, right up until the very last moment, and you have to learn the script off by heart. So the, but the script was constantly changing. A tiny bit more water, please. Um, and I had two young interns with me, uh, rather than my producer. <clears throat> so these interns, although they were well-intentioned, didn't have quite the experience they, they, they could have had uh, to support me on this live shoot. So my news producer, my very experienced producer, was back at base, just a bit more water. And um, I changed locations twice. Both times the cab driver was, was lost. Uh, we went to one location, the shot didn't look right, so NBC said, can you go to another location? A bit more water in there, please. And it was pouring down with rain. A bit more water. And it was freezing, it was absolutely freezing. It was April. Okay, how are you doing there? Okay, all right. Uh, so what happened that evening was, um, <laughs> was a moment that uh, was, was is, you can't find on the internet anymore. I think very wisely NBC took it down. But let me tell you what happened. So five, four, three, two, one, cue to zine. And my mind went blank. I couldn't remember what I had to say. I couldn't remember my words. I couldn't remember the opening line. So, um, and just keeping in mind, I was being watched by millions and millions of people in America. And uh, so I started to ad lib. And you know, I ad libbed pretty badly. I couldn't find the right words. Anyway, somehow or the other, I managed to get through it. Uh, finished the broadcast, it was about three or four minutes. Three or four of the most painful moments of my life, and perhaps three or four of the most painful moments of NBC News's life too. And my producer called me straight afterwards, and he said, what happened? This is the producer who was back at base rather than with me. What happened? What the heck happened? And 
I just said, I don't know. I just really don't know. Now, just, just to remind you, I'd been going live for about two decades. I'd worked undercover. I'd worked on very big stories. I'd worked on some of the biggest stories of our generation. I'd worked on some very big and very stressful stories and fortunately had never really lost my nerve in that way. So what was going on? Well, I was struggling with quite a few things in my personal life, but I thought that, you know, I'd been doing this job for a very long time. I could just do what I always did. I could still turn up at work and do what I did in the way that I always did. Work was the easy bit. And because my self-awareness, my emotional intelligence, if you like, was so low, I didn't know that this moment was coming. I didn't know that these five or six tiny bits of... No, no, no more water. Five or six tiny bits of... You had enough yet? You're supporting your arm, aren't you? I can see that. Hold it out. Um, <laughs> five or six... These five or six tiny bits of stress, while I had this bigger amount of stress going on, uh, was really starting to be the straw that broke the camel's back. NBC were very kind about it. They just went, no, we hardly noticed. Big lie. Um, and, uh, but, you know, it was a real mortifying moment for me. And psychologists say, how are you finding that, by the way? It would be more efficient if you told me to pour it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, how are you finding it in terms of just holding that paper cup? It's all right. It's all right so far, although you cheated when I wasn't looking. You pulled it back towards yeah. you. So the reason I was trying this experiment, which hasn't quite gone right, is be because you cheated, um, <laughs> is because psychologists say that holding stress, even the tiniest amount of stress, you might think, oh, I can manage that because it's a little bit like holding a paper cup of water, just a tiny bit of water. But cumulatively, it's actually unsustainable. You cannot do it. You probably couldn't do it for the rest of this talk. Um, and you might find yourself gradually cheating a bit more. But you can't cheat stress. You cannot escape it. So what psychologists say is that if you just try this experiment to see a sort of visual representation of what stress can do, this is what it can do to you. You cannot hold it. You'll find yourself leaning in for support. But actually, we don't do that when we're stressed. We don't look for support. We just find a way in our very packed, very exciting lives to just get on with it. But actually, it can just come out from behind you, and it can grab you by the neck, and it can make you look like a total idiot in front of millions of people watching in America. So thank you very much for doing that. Can you please give him a round of applause? Thank you. So there's only so much you can, you can do before it starts to overspill or before the paper cup, if you like, would just collapse on itself. But here's the thing. If I just paid attention that evening to what my body was doing, if I just paid attention to my physiology, I could have actually done something about it. What I would have noticed, first of all, is that I'd have been a little bit hotter than normal. I would have noticed that um, maybe my voice was getting huskier. As I get tired or I get stressed, my voice tends to get huskier. I would have noticed perhaps that my stomach was sinking. I may have noticed, it doesn't happen to me, but it happens to other people, my hands were getting perhaps clammy, perspiring. There's a whole bunch of things that tend to happen to you physiologically. You probably all have your own stress responses that you may or may not be aware of. And all I really needed to do in that moment was just breathe. Because in a moment of stress or shock or surprise, you stop breathing or you breathe very, very, in a very shallow way. So you're not taking the deep breaths that you need to. The good thing about that mortifying, humiliating, terrible moment was that it led me to where I am today. Because by profession, I am curious. I am inquisitive by, pro by profession. I am an investigator by profession. And I wanted to really understand what on earth happened to me that night. I really wanted to research this. And by doing that, I found myself where I am today. Now, when you get training to go into war zones, as I've been trained, one of the basic things, you get a whole bunch of very interesting, quite intricate training, but one of the most basic things that they teach you is that when you go into a war zone, you can expect a bomb to go off, a shooting to happen, a major incident to kick off, someone you're with to get injured terribly, to suddenly get um, a bunch of people turn up and try to kidnap you. There's a whole bunch of things that they train you for. The very basic thing they teach us first and foremost, and these are ex-soldiers who teach us, give us this training, they say, just take three deep breaths. Long on the in and longer on the out. And you can do this in any environment before you're about to do a talk like this, before you're about to go into a stressful meeting, an interview, whatever it might be, just take three deep breaths. So we were taught, a bomb's gone off. Take your three deep breaths and then go and deal with it. 
because you're otherwise you're starving your brain of oxygen and trying to deal with something extremely stressful while you're not really thinking straight. So I'm going to get you to do, just for a moment, what I did. So could you just all sit back in your seats and just close your eyes. Just really get comfortable, fill the back of your seats against yourselves and just relax. And close your eyes and quietly take a few deep breaths. So really feel the breath going in through your nostrils, into your lungs. Hold it in your stomach and then release, long on the out. And just try to empty your mind as you're breathing of the chaotic story I just told you, of your own lives. Just concentrate on your breathing. Long, deep breaths. Pay attention to your body. Where is the tension? As you release, where is the tension? Another deep breath. Feel the tension. and then release it with your breath. Okay, now you can open your eyes. Okay, my friends, you are ready for a war zone. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so meditation every day is um, really important, and I've been doing it every day since I learned how important that was. So let me tell, talk to you about EQ, because part of that journey, meditation was one small part of that journey where I found myself today. So what is EQ? EQ is all of these things, self-awareness, self-regulation, relationship with yourself, relationship with others, being able to read people properly, and reflection, reflecting upon your actions, reflecting upon the actions of, your, of, the other, of other people. Very briefly, I'm just going to give you some history of IQ, which is where EQ came from. So IQ emerged at the start of World War I, when we were, at the time, we were thinking about who should get which jobs, so which men should do which jobs. And depending on IQ, the, you know, certain men would go do the uh, strategic jobs, some would do the desk jobs, some would be the foot soldiers. This developed, there's a lot of really interesting research, which I haven't got time to go into now, but it, this developed over the, that century, into the 1930s, sort of they started talking about it as social intelligence, uh, then it became humanistic psychology, looking at the self, understanding the self. And then it became what we started to understand today as emotional intelligence. This was in the 1980s. And it's only really over the last decade or so that it's had some real prominence. And today, in the last few years, it started to get some new momentum. Now, IQ versus EQ. So many people argue that IQ is genetic. It's actually how job people are chosen for their jobs often. It's genetic. Many people argue it can't be changed, it's fixed. There's still a lot of debate around this, whether or not you can grow it. However, there is no debate about whether or not EQ can be grown or developed. You can grow it, you can strengthen it, and it can make you really powerful. No argument about it. Now, the reason why EQ matters is because our emotional mind is our radar for danger. It's the one that gives our, where we rely on our gut, where we go, my gut tells me something's not right about this, but my mind hasn't quite caught up yet. It makes intuitive judgments. If we were to wait for our thinking mind, we may not only be wrong, we may also be dead. That's why our emotional radar for danger is so important. But the downside is, and this is why we don't really pay much attention to our emotions or to our EQ, is emotions can be very, very strong. They can be overactive, they can interfere with our thinking. They can take our beliefs to be true, they can discount evidence to the contrary. The rational mind is very tentative. New evidence can disconfirm belief. Think about those times when you're arguing with somebody or you're, or you're arguing, you're, you're really feeling cross yourself and you're thinking, you know, I'm so angry, I can't think straight. That, that's your emotional mind overriding things. And this is why we need our EQ to be very strong, because if our EQ is strong, we can not only regulate ourselves so our emotions don't override, but we can also use our emotions in a very powerful way. So EQ is our friend. If we, it helps us recognize, understand, be aware, regulate our behavior, read people, manage our relationships, learn from others. Now. We don't really teach EQ in schools. Our generation, none of us would have been taught emotional intelligence. They're starting to do it, but they don't call it EQ. They call it circle time. Those of you who have children will know about this. Circle time, PHSE, maybe life skills. 
Sometimes, you know, organizations are now asking people like me to come in and run workshops about EQ or talk about EQ. It's finally being recognized. Now, traditionally, organizations call up and they say, oh, you know, we've got some soft skills money we'd like to use. And I'm going, no, 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 this isn't soft skills. These are power skills. I really disagree that these are soft skills because we're, most of us, because we're British, where these are severely underdeveloped skills and it would make us much stronger in the workplace. So here's what it could help with. Decision-making, teamwork, assertiveness, leadership, staff turnover, change, well-being, stress, personal relationships, happiness. Two key bits of research I'm going to share with you very quickly. Travis Bradbury, who's carried out research into thousands of people, he said 90% of high performers are high in EQ, while just 20% of low performers are high in EQ. Second piece of research, Daniel Goleman, who has been writing books about emotional intelligence for about 10 years, he says that the difference between those with high IQ who either do well or do badly is about how much emotional intelligence they have. So the research shows that those with a high EQ can easily outperform those with high IQs. That's something you've probably not heard before. Okay, so there's all the research in a nutshell. I've just sort of given you 10 minutes introductory into like 100 years of research. But what I'd like you to do now, so I think the research is all very well, is I'd like you to just see what this really means in practical terms. So take a quick look at this list. Don't spend too, too much time on it, just choose a word. You're not going to be judged for the word you choose. Don't think too hard. Just go in your gut, choose a word. Everybody, I want to assume everybody's done that in three, two, one. It's gone, okay? So that word you chose, that quality, that emotion, I want you to think about how would a person with that quality or that emotion that you've just chosen behave? What would, what would be going on for them? Now I'd like you to turn to the person next to you, um, and if it's someone you know, turn to someone new. Say hello to them, introduce yourself, find out their name. And embodying this quality that you've chosen, this very quality, it doesn't matter how negative, embodying this quality, I'd like you to introduce yourself to that person and talk about either today's weather or your commute here. Okay? <laughs> You're looking terrified. Okay, off you go. Okay, okay, now what I'd like you to do is just very quickly turn back to that person and tell them what you think their quality was, okay? Off you go, very quickly. Okay. How many of you? How many of you got that right? How many of you got it right? Come on, can I can I see your hands right up? Okay, not even a third. Not even a third. And how many of you? How did you find that? Was that difficult to do? Was it easy to do? It was easy to do. Was it? Okay. Who found it? Who found? How many of you found it difficult? To both embody an emotion and also to try and read somebody else at the same time. Oh, you all found it really easy. That's why you all did so well. <laughs> it was tricky, right? It is a tricky thing to do. But the good thing about this is you can learn to do it better. But it's about increasing your self-awareness. So that's your first exercise in EQ. Understanding your emotion, expressing it, and reading someone else's emotion at the same time. Okay, next exercise, self-regulation. So unregulated emotions, we all have them. 
at moments when we're not feeling calm, we're not feeling good about ourselves. But to be able to regulate our emotions, we have to be able to name them. There's a lot of research that shows, well, first of all, our emotional literacy in this country is very low. That's very well established. But there's research that shows that people who can identify, who are prone to loan moods, cannot identify and name their own emotions. So if someone's suffering from depression, often it's because they can't really go, I'm, apart from I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling low, they have no sophisticated vernacular lexicon, if you like, uh, to be able to name their own emotions. So it's really important that um, you learn to name your own emotions, and we teach our children to as well. Now, I've chosen emoticons because this is Google, but sometimes you just use like face, facial expressions. So there's around six to nine non-positive to negative emotions here. So when I say non-positive, it's sort of neutral. One person's non-positive might be another person's negative. There's about six to nine here. You could very quickly in your mind identify as many, many of them as you can, um, name them if you can as well. But what I'd like you to do is pick one very quickly, one of the negative ones, okay? And I'd like you to, with the person next to you, is just name what that emotion is, and what a person who might be feeling that emotion, what might they be going through in their body, so physiologically. So for instance, I'm gonna pick, um, I'll pick the one that looks confused. That's the second one from the left, in case you didn't see that one, uh, the middle row. So I'm gonna pick the one that looks confused. So I'd say that that one looks uh, bewildered, um, in the mind, discombobulated, unsettled. In the body, they'd be feeling maybe a little bit empty, a bit numb. They might have butterflies. Okay, so that's what you're doing. So you've picked one, don't pick confused. Pick something else, because that's cheating. Um, pick one of the others, and just with the person next to you, a new person, so the person on the other side, behind you in front, can you name what that um, emotion is and what that person would be going through in their mind and their body? Off you go. Okay. Okay. How how did you you guys over there still going? How did um, how did you find that? Was it easy to think about um, what physiologically that person might be going through? Because somebody who's feeling confused will be feeling very differently to somebody who's frustrated or angry or embarrassed. So it's worth thinking, I mean, if there was more time, I'd get you to think about what the different physiological reactions are. But perhaps it's worth you thinking about what happens to me physically when I'm embarrassed versus when I'm frustrated and paying attention to that because regulating your emotions is the way that you can make yourself much more in control of situations. So long-term regulation, there are obvious things like mindfulness, yoga, walking, spending a lot more time to, you know, talking to your close, in your close relationships, but, uh, but generally just being able to breathe and also name your emotions, understand them much more is, uh, is another way around. Okay, your final exercise. I'd like you to draw a line 
from one side to the other um, on your notebooks or phones or wherever you've got. And on one side is rational, but I for intellectual. And then the other side is emotional, okay? And I'd like you to have a think about, so if rational is someone who is thinking very clearly, very analytically, very intellectually, and the other person, on the other, the, the other spectrum, side of the spectrum, that that's someone who's very emotionally intuitive, someone who depends on their gut, on their feelings, a sense that they get, they use their emotions to be powerful. I'd like you to think about where you are on this line when it comes to work, so office, colleagues, clients. And maybe you could identify that, for instance, if you find that you're very intellectual, you tend to be very rational, as here, and put a W. And now I'd like you to think about where you are when it comes to your personal life, family, friends, most intimate relationships. And if you're over here, let's say, you'd put P for personal. Okay, so just very quickly do that. And now I'd like you to have a quick think, as you're just looking down at what you've just done. Do I need to move? If I was to move in a direction that was not the way that I'm normally inclined, so if I'm quite uh, intellectual in my, in, my, uh, per, in my professional life, if I was to move in that direction, would that be a good thing? Why don't I do it? What do I worry about? What stops me? And in my personal life, am I often accused of being too emotional? What happens if I was to move and be much more rational, be calmer, be intellectual? Would that be a good thing? And if I'm not doing it, why aren't I doing it? It's probably a very good reason why I'm not. But what would happen if I did? This is the EQ growth bit. But what I'd like you to, that's, that's a bit of homework for you to take away. But what I'd like you to think about now, very quickly in twos, is how different am I in my personal and my professional life? Is that difference serving me well? Because true happiness, there's a lot of research, psychologists are researching happiness, and they say true happiness comes from authenticity and being one whole self. So it doesn't mean bringing a very emotional side to work all the time, but not having such great disparity. That's why you'll often feel like I'm not really being myself. Work doesn't quite fit because I'm like this personally, or my personal life isn't quite working because this is how I really want to be. So can I just get you in twos just to think about whether or not there's a disparity and how that's serving you? Yeah? Okay. Can I get you all back? Can I get you all back? You can do some talking over lunch. Can I just get you back? Thank you. Um, so I don't know if you're willing to, in the spirit of openness, just put your hands up to tell me if um, you felt there was a real, anyone who felt there was a real disparity? No, you're not going to do that here, are you? Um, you will? Who will do that? Yes. Would you share your thoughts? 
was absolutely shocked that mine's the wrong way around. And I thought to myself that I'd have much more emotional intelligence at home where I'm with my family and that's where all the emotion is and I'll be much more logical and my IQ would be higher at work. Oh, wow. And when looking at it, I realized that um, as the CEO of a company, it's really important to me to keep expressing exactly the right message and to think about everything I say to different people. And yeah. then when I get at home, I don't spend enough time doing that. And oh. so, yeah, so I was, I was I mean, are, there, are there any key ways you can think that at home that might be oh, having an impact? Just apply the same concept. That, you know, just yeah. take the time to think about the, the message that you're giving and how that will be interpreted and instead yeah. of just saying it and let, letting it out. And it's, you know, perhaps worth just thinking about why is there such disparity? Am I giving so much at work? Because, you know, using your EQ is quite exhausting. It's actually more exhausting than using your, into your IQ. Agreed. So maybe that when you get home, you're just like, uh, I think here's what we need to do, just get it done. Right. Yeah, yeah and that's, a, that's a much, I've got to think about why, and that's yeah. a much deeper, that's going to take me wow. some time. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. No worries. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, I know, how brave. Thank you. Anybody else? No? Come on, one more person. Even if it's to say I'm like a perfect, well-rounded human being, and I sit right in the middle of this. No? Oh, one person over here. Yes, two. Hello, my name is Ursula. Hello. What we found out uh, together, because we are not British, is actually in our countries, yeah. when we work, we are more emotional. Well, actually, we're, we move, since we moved here, we have to be too strict more. To <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so depressing. That's so because, depressing. You, know, you we are more Spanish, passionate, right? so, you know, so this is why You've here. You've come to Britain and we've ruined you. We've basically yes, spoiled you your emotional but intelligence. Don't worry, I can use this skill with my husband at home. What well, actually, I'm giving his direction, so... <laughs> oh, okay, is he British? <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. And just the chap uh, at the end. Did you, did you want to... You in the white T-shirt No. Yes? Okay, come on. Yeah, um, so yeah, at work I'm very, very rational until uh, I've got too much on and then I become more emotional. So it's a, it's a spectrum for me. Well, you know, that's about self-regulation. So that's like the stress moment where you've just kind of, it's overspill. So, but it's interesting that you're so rational and then the minute you're stressed, it becomes very emotional. Exactly. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. Okay, well, look, there is like an endless amount of... Uh, work in this area. Um, here are some other EQ matters that you can look at. Networking, building relationships, introversion, extroversion, that's a very a key thing that defines us. Leadership, imposter syndrome, sensitivity and intuitiveness, authenticity is really important, assertiveness, resilience, managing adversity, all of this matters as much professionally as it does personally. I'm sure you can see that all in your own workplaces. There is so much more to tell you about this, but I am out of time. But you can get in touch. Here are my, my contact details. You can take a photograph of this slide if you like. Um, you can get in touch, and I'm going to be around here for a bit. So um, do come over, and if you want to talk to me privately then, or want to ask me some more questions about my work, I'd love to talk to you. Do you have any questions before I go? Like, not one question. One? No? Okay, you all know everything you need to know about EQ now. You're all set. Yes, one over there. Um, hi, so I'd be interested to hear how you think people should sit on that scale between work and their personal life. Does it really matter or is it just the fact that they're close together? I think, um, well, look, I think, you know, authenticity is really important. So if you're naturally very rational, you were brought up in a very rational family, then you can't force yourself to go down to this end. But anybody who sits too far in this spectrum or that spectrum is not in a good space. Um, so it is probably good to be somewhere in this sort of this area here, but also to have flexibility, to be able to move back and forth within it. There are times at work where you just do need to be very clear and rational, a matter of fact, uh, but there are times also when you may be dealing with maybe staff turnover or sackings or whatever it might be where you might need to use a bit more emotional intelligence. Um, or if there's, you know, big change happening, you might need to use more emotional intelligence. And at home, likewise, if there's a very practical thing that needs to happen, spending too much time getting very emotionally overwrought isn't going to be helpful. But this spectrum is important, but being able to move back and forth, sort of flexibility to go back and forth is important. But that comes from self-awareness, like being aware of what's going on for you. Thank you for that question. Okay, well, thank you very much. It was a real pleasure and an honor to speak to you. Thank you.